Before we get started, I want to let you know that we have launched our first spring fundraising drive, now through May 30th. Jung is for everyone, and your donation will help ensure that our programs in analytical psychology continue to make Jung available to learners of all levels, near and far. Jung writes, we must be able to let things happen in the psyche. For us, this becomes a real art of which few people know anything. The Jung Institute of Chicago supports individuals in the art of letting things happen in the psyche. Through your generous gift, you actively participate in this creative process. During the drive, we will be releasing one podcast episode per week. Uh, you may have actually noticed that we're releasing podcast episodes more often, um, and your support can ensure that we can continue to do that. To make a donation, just click the link in the show notes or go to youngchicago.org slash give. I also want to remind everybody that the Jungian Psychotherapy Program and Jungian Studies Program are open for enrollment. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the program and perhaps fill out the application form, just visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungi Anthology Podcast from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Cosmos as Myth and Human Possibility with Robert Moore, Ph.D. This episode is the first session of the series Cosmos as Myth and Human Possibility from the series description. More and more people are beginning to raise the question of whether it is realistic to hope for the continued viability of our home planet. Jungian analyst and author Robert Moore leads a workshop examining the cross-cultural mythology of the struggle for cosmos, for a just and peaceful world order, a struggle that has fascinated our forebears for thousands of years. In addition to analyzing the central characteristics of the mythology of cosmos, this workshop examines the ties between selfhood and world-making, inner work and outer engagement, personal dreaming, and the world future. It concludes with a reflection on the significance of this mythology for our contemporary efforts to envision a viable human and humane future in a sustainable ecological environment. It was recorded in 1993. There's a link to the complete series in the show notes. Robert Moore, PhD, was Distinguished Service Professor of Psychology, Psychoanalysis, and Spirituality in the Graduate Center of the Chicago Theological Seminary, where he was the founding director of the New Institute for Advanced Studies in Spirituality and Wellness. He served as training analyst at the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago and was director of research for the Institute for Integrative Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy and the Chicago Center for Integrative Psychotherapy. Author and editor of numerous books, which are listed in the show notes, also available on our website. Before we get to the lecture, I want to read a few more submissions from our listeners. John from the United States says, underwent Jungian analysis starting in 2009, age 48 after an emotionally overwhelming and irrational event upended my life. I used the podcast search engine to find Jungian podcasts and looking for insight into myself. JHW from the UK and South Africa says, life changes started six years ago, started listening to this Jungian life and your podcast around the same time. Been doing transpersonal therapy in UK for two years. The best things I've done for myself. Gone back to school and want to find time to learn more every day. I'm listening to my subconscious and dreams. Beautiful development, grateful and blessed. If you would like us to know a little bit about you, just click the link in the show notes and I'll read your submission on the podcast. You can support this free podcast by making a donation, becoming a member of the Institute, or making a purchase in our online store. Your support enables us to provide free and low-cost 
educational resources to all. Now, let's get to the lecture. This uh, workshop is entitled Cosmos as Myth and Human Possibility. And uh, I want to welcome all of you uh, as participants both here and uh, in the uh, tape audience listening. Uh, we're going to work in three sections uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, the first part, we're going to be looking at first at the study of myth and its relevance and trying to get some sense about the varieties of approach to mythology and uh, I'm going to characterize the points of view that, we're, that I'm not going to represent and try to give you a sense of the kind of attitudes toward myth and the kind of tradition and interpretation of myth that, uh, that I think is valuable for us uh, in our project together and uh, that is valuable for us to carry forward together uh, beyond this workshop. And then uh, we'll hopefully we'll keep that down. We've got about, uh, about two hours uh, this morning. And uh, in the rest of the morning, we'll be looking at the specific mythology of cosmos uh, in uh, human history. And to focus that, uh, I will be uh, presenting myself around Mircea Iliadi's work on mythology uh, and the mythology of cosmos. Uh, and then uh, I'll try to keep that uh, as brief as possible so that then we can share together uh, from your own studies of images of cosmos and the mythical or spiritual traditions that you're familiar with. Uh, and uh, we will be uh, trying to get in images and themes from the uh, studies that we've all uh, journeyed upon. And uh, that should get us to lunch and give you a lot to reflect on at lunchtime. After lunch, when we come back uh, and get started uh, right at 2 o'clock, we will be turning to uh, Jungian psychology uh, in understanding this particular mythic motif. And we'll, we'll start with Jung's work and I will want to differentiate Jung's work from uh, some of the other uh, traditions of interpretation on this. And then we will be focusing in on the particular understanding of this image uh, and the way I understand that it uh, takes its place in psychological geography uh, and its particular uh, role. And I will be emphasizing in particular the relationship between uh, cosmos and selfhood cosmos and the development of a cohesive, uh, empowered, uh, what Carl Rogers years ago would have called a fully functioning self. Uh, and, uh, and what I hope that we will see before the end of the day today uh, is that in contrast to some of the people that present themselves as experts on myth today, uh, mythology is full of riches in understanding uh, our potential as a species, our psychological and, sp and spiritual potential as a species. And it's nowhere more clear than in this particular kind of mythology. Uh, and uh, so I hope that by the end of the day today, you will, you will be able to have a, at least a feel by letting your right brain scan these images. Uh, and uh, letting your left brain uh, work a lot with all this uh, meta-theoretical stuff that I'm going to be presenting uh, and then moving into clinical stuff uh, this afternoon. But uh, so today, today's schedule is full of looking at the mythic image and then getting, trying to get serious about a psychology of this. Uh, and I want us to save tomorrow uh, from uh, 10 to 1 for us to shift gears from the uh, uh, inner work kind of perspective and to uh, look at this as an image for what is possible for us as a species uh, 
in the context of our public responsibilities and the ecological challenges we face and the political challenges we face and the uh, what is very probably the greatest uh, uh, problem of all is that when people start facing the size of the dragon, uh, the cynicism and nihilism which almost immediately uh, follows and the loss of energy and loss of uh, will which, which follows. I mean, it's one thing to get into denial about evil and maintain your energy but it's quite another thing to face the size of the crisis uh, which we face on so many fronts uh, and still maintain your energy, direction, uh, and commitment toward establishing uh, the reality that is imaged uh, in, these, um, in these mythic images. So uh, We'll have an overnight to be reflecting, and we'll think together before we stop today about some questions that we should address tomorrow. And uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing your uh, input. So let me, if, if that's all right with you, uh, then let's jump in, and I will go uh, through this that's on the board as rapidly as I can to save us some time for some sharing. <clears throat> let me just begin by saying that being persons interested in Jungian approaches to mythology, that this puts you in a kind of a small minority uh, of persons, although it's quite clear that a lot of people are gaining an interest in this as the obvious bankruptcy of many other points of view becomes more and more evident. Uh, still, people that are, first of all, really capable of valuing Jung's work on the one hand, and secondly, really realizing that there may be something in ancient wisdom uh, that is worth our mining today. Uh, uh, the commitment to those two ideas puts you in a, in a, unfortunately, rather small minority. And let me just say, for those of you that are not familiar with academic trends, uh, about these topics. Let me just, in, for a moment, talk about them. Under the title, The Trivialization of Myth, uh, the unfortunate thing is, you know, it's a matter of consumerism and in, uh, in intellectual things. Uh, the unfortunate thing is there are a lot of people with big credentials, you know, uh, degrees from very uh, impressive places. Uh, who use their intellects, uh, in fact, to destroy mythology, or at the very least to make it so trivial in significance uh, that only the most uh, pedantic of specialists in special careers in certain forms of Asian studies or, or comparative religions or something would be interested in it. Uh, let me give you... Uh, uh, an example of this, I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, bibliographies provided in the American Academy of Religion uh, meetings, you will find many sections of, of discussions on mythology. And what these usually are, dis discussions of different theories of interpretation of mythology. And there's an enormous spectrum of these things, and the trends today is toward emphasizing how these mythologies are simply specific to particular tribal regional locations. It is not at all politically or intellectually acceptable today to talk about the ways in which human mythology may reflect common human themes that are consistent across the species. In fact, the amazing thing today is that it is not politically or intellectually correct uh, in the, even the most prestigious academic circles to, to talk about the human species as a species. The emphasis in the so-called postmodern movements and the so-called deconstructionist movements is to so radically uh, atomize and tribalize particular mythic traditions 
that you never can emphasize uh, what I want to emphasize, that is, mythology is human-animal behavior. That is, uh, I am on the other end of the stick from the dominant academic uh, point of view. Uh, and let me say that uh, a fellow Hyde Parker, Wendy Doniger, probably represents the other end of the stick from me. And while she's been superficially associated with Jungians and in conferences uh, with Joseph Campbell, that is a totally uh, a misleading association. Uh, Wendy Doniger uh, uh, is a prime example of the kind of uh, trivialization of human mythology uh, that I think is uh, 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 really abysmal. And, uh, and I want to say that uh, 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 if you uh, read her work, she's a very smart person. But here's one of the things we need to get clear. Being smart uh, does not mean that one is valuing a lot of the meaning that is in a particular tradition or, or area of study. Uh, some of the smartest people in the world today are using their intelligence to, to destroy meaning. And so let me just say that, that not only are these people emphasizing that uh, different racial groups, different ethnic groups, have, no, have very little in common in their tribal meanings. Uh, they take people like Campbell, Joseph Campbell, and Mercia Iliadi, and ridicule them. Why? Because, fundamentally, because they emphasize the human continuity of the uh, insights of human mythology. So you and I need to understand today uh, what, uh, what tradition uh, my presentation and the context that I'm going to try to uh, present uh, uh, stands and what is the tradition that I stand in. And it is not of those today that are simply saying that all of these traditions are atomistic and tribal and, and you really can't say that there's anything uh, uh, paralleling between an African tribal myth and a, uh, a North European tribal myth or a South American tribal myth. See. So in other words, to, to uh, uh, focus this, you need to look at the recent attacks on Joseph Campbell that have come out. I mean, uh, the amazing, uh, incredible, uh, what I conceive to be fundamentally envy attacks uh, on Joseph Campbell uh, to, uh, to uh, destroy any kind of appreciation for his enormous uh, contribution to the study of mythology. Iliadi is less well known in the culture as a whole, but he has got his enormous detractors as well. Uh, there is some, there's an amazing thing that uh, they try to do to these men as well as Jung. Uh, each of these men, let's see, from uh, the great German anthropologist Adolf Bastian to Joseph Campbell to Carl Jung to Mertzi Iliadi, each of them emphasized the unity of the human species, the psychological and spiritual unity of the human species. And each of them have, have recently come under attack for having their thought allegedly serve tribal, fascist, neo-Nazi interest. To me, that is an amazing missing of the central point. These persons are the, the main tradition which emphasizes non-racist uh, human uh, mythology. So. I mean, it's important for us to get that clear and on the table at the beginning, because I, I want publicly to associate myself with that tradition, uh, believing that we human beings are the species which mythologizes. We all do it. And when we don't think we're doing it, we are doing it in the most archaic of ways. So in other words, uh, uh, if we are not valuing and participating in uh, communal mythologies, uh, 
then we're probably possessed by a personal one, personal mythology. So anyway, that's a context. So I want to, I would like to, uh, to just begin, uh, though, in terms of, of, of our reflection on this, before I get into laying out Iliadi's take on cosmos mythology, um, I would like to, uh, most of you have studied Campbell and his approach to mythology, and let me just, let me just, uh, before leaving Joseph Campbell, who I honor, I want to honor greatly his memory, uh, let's just ask you to say, what did Campbell believe was the reason we ought to be studying mythology together? Now, you probably saw the Power of Myth series on television, uh, some of those things. Uh, can you just lift up some of the basic ideas that Campbell uh, uh, felt uh, was an impetus for us to study uh, mythology? Anybody? Yes? Uh, not any one tradition had the bottom line. Right. Not any one tradition had the bottom line or the sole truth. There's a sense in which uh, we human beings bring with us a treasure in a mosaic. And each tribal perspective has a piece of that mosaic. So what else would you say about Campbell's particular? Talk about the personal meaning of his myths, so that in terms of individual uh, needs, quests, developments, it could be right. learned from. He uh, she says that Campbell emphasized the, the personal meaning of the study of mythology, that it emphasized motifs and patterns of our individual human struggles that all of us participate in. And so, for example, when he was uh, teaching about, if you saw that segment on sacrifice, uh, there is a sense in which uh, we all have to learn about sacrifice if we're to become fully mature human beings. And uh, his assumption is that uh, if people have been reflecting on this for thousands of years, they might have something intelligent to say about this. And so we can learn about our personal journeys. Uh, from uh, from the study of mythology. Uh, anything else you can add? Yes. Well, relating to what's been said, don't get stuck on the metaphor. <laughs> yes. She says, don't get stuck on the metaphor, uh, meaning that the truth, the spiritual uh, or psychological truth that is being intuited by this human animal using the radical complexity of its brain that is evolved, uh, can express itself in many images. There are many different kind of images which can express very similar central truths. Now this is, uh, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of uh, studying recent interpretation theory, uh, uh, something like the work of Paul Ricoeur, uh, then, I mean, you need to be aware that the, the movement in it in the philosophy of interpretation, hermeneutics, is to emphasize that symbols give rise to thought, and uh, symbols are in an invitation to get into deep reflection in which you can get past the symbol to uh, other expressions of, of similar insight. And that any particular symbol has a surplus of meaning. We're going to be talking about a surplus of being a little bit later. And we ought to think about the relationship between the surplus of meaning and the surplus of being, uh, because I think that's really deeply uh, entwined in this. Anybody else have a thought about Campbell's contribution? Yeah. Would it be fair to say that, that you know, all, each myth was an attempt to, to um, kind of get an idea as to what kind of a world we're living in? Mm -hmm going on here? Right. What are we doing here? Uh, right. That each myth, one of the things that Campbell uh, w was, was saying is that myths do provide a sort of a location for us. Uh, uh, where have we come from? What is the nature of the situation we're in? That's kind of what the spiritual traditions have called uh, diagnostics or discernment. Uh, and, and paralleling that, uh, uh, an image of what's possible. You know, it's a lot of people today do a lot of work with psychopathology, but they don't bother to tell you what 
we might be like if we were healthy. Uh, so uh, the myth, according to what you're saying, it gave an assessment of the present and the situation, but in terms of the mythology we're looking at today, it also imaged what healthy people might do together. Yes. This is maybe reiterating something that's made clear in your work mm -hmm. as well as in uh, all, all that you said, but that when, I, when we read, or it seemed when Campbell spoke, and the energy of Campbell was of adding value to the human yes. as a human, and that we were never alone. Yes. He says that uh, one of the main things that he sees in it was that, that it was Campbell's gift in his teaching about myth to do it in such a way that you could see the way that the study of mythology heightened our sense of our own significance and worth. Now that is really important, and I want you to just bracket that and hold that for the whole weekend, because that's related to the surplus of being and the surplus of meaning. Uh, it's related to, remind me if I don't come back to it this morning, uh, automatically remind me somebody to, to bring up the, the way this relates to Gnosticism, because there is, a, there is a Gnostic parallel to this about fullness, the sense of fullness. So Campbell knew from his own studies and the effect of them on his life uh, the role of myth in helping us to raise our sense of personal significance. Now this is uh, so important for, especially for what we're going to talk about tomorrow, because here's the thing, if you don't feel extremely significant and important, you are not going to do any decisive work for the future of the planet or for the future of your community or the future of your city. One of the things that, that uh, we see all over everywhere now is how immobilized people are. Now you can be immobilized by a sense of your significance, I don't get me wrong. I mean, if you get kind of mainlining, shooting up with grandiosity, that can uh, make you have insomnia and, uh, and uh, you can be immobilized and have to drink a lot of booze or take a lot of dope to calm down. So that's, one, that's another way of becoming immobilized. But there are a lot more people that get immobilized because of their, their lack of a sense of significance than get immobilized because they have too much a sense of their significance. So we're talking statistically here. Uh, so anyway, uh, and that's a good place for us to, to remember Joseph Campbell because, uh, you know, when people say of Joseph Campbell that he was neither a gentleman nor a scholar, you know, we have an old Southern saying, consider the source, <laughs> you know? And anybody that says that kind of thing about Joseph Campbell, I'm sorry. I mean, they, have, they deserve basic respect as a human being, but intellectually, I have absolutely no respect for them anymore after that point. Uh, because he made probably the greatest contribution to our sense of human possibility and human future, and he gave us one of the most powerful invitations as a species to work together to imagine uh, a post-tribal human future. So, uh, so it's in that, in that context and in his spirit that I hope we can reflect on these things for the, for the rest of our time together. But let me shift now to Mircea Iliadi, who uh, was, uh, I'm, I love to say, a, a fellow Hyde Parker. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be able, back when I was young, to study with him at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, Unlike Campbell, Iliadi, I don't think, was a great teacher uh, in the sense of being a lecturer or, or that sort of thing. But what he did was he modeled such fantastic commitment to the significance of his topic that we all were so inspired by just his sheer seriousness of interest in studying world mythical traditions and world religions that the sheer force of his excitement, enthusiasm about his topic overshadowed the fact that he didn't like to lecture. 
and he didn't really like to bother with students too much, you know. He was a classic magician, in my view, you know. I mean, like, just don't bother me with students. Let me get down to my text, you know. But in any case, uh, he, in my view, is probably uh, one of the most neglected sources for us today. He left an enormous legacy, and I want to invite all of you in the years to come to, to start getting into Iliadi's work and prepare yourself for the kind of careful uh, cataloging of, of records about archaic traditional cultures that uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you may get really bored really fast. But if you know what you're doing, you will maintain your interest. And if you approach Iliadi as a resource for getting you back to our records of, of uh, the ritual and mythic practices of uh, what he called homo religiosus, religious human beings, uh, then you won't get bored so easily. And you'll find his work, his many, many, many books, to be a tremendous resource. Uh, I think for... If, if somebody wants really to be a Jungian in a serious way today, they need to use Iliadi as a real soul brother uh, on, the, uh, on the journey of studies because he has done so much work that you and I don't have the time to do to collect this stuff. And he's presented it to us in a useful way. Look, for example, uh, let me give you some references on important books for you to look at of Iliadi's just to get into it. Uh, you, should, you should read his book, The Sacred and the Profane. It's a good introduction to his understanding of, of uh, the experience of uh, uh, pre-modern human beings. And he has many others. There is a, there is a two-volume uh, reader that you can probably get in the libraries. I'm trying to get reprinted now. I'm trying to get them to bring it back out. It's out of print, but it's called Myth, Rites, and Symbols. Um, and uh, it is just an edited compendium of his work. Uh, he edited a thing called From Primitives to Zen. And, uh, and they're, they've brought that out in another series, and all of those are available from the, uh, from the uh, uh, University of Chicago Press and the Young Institute Bookstore uh, can get you uh, uh, any of those works that you need. So just to say that there's this enormous body of work, most people don't touch it anymore, uh, unfortunately. And one of my agendas for the, for the wider Jungian community is for us to, to, to use Iliadi to get us more deeply into a sense of the uh, experience of, uh, of tribal uh, human beings as they looked at the sacred. So let me just leave you with that, in, that, that invitation. Now, let me just start for a moment with Iliadi's general understanding of the importance of myth, and then we'll get into the uh, specific emphasis on the concept of cosmos. Uh, why, why don't I talk a little bit about the, uh, the general understanding of myth in Iliadi, and then we'll take a stretch break, and then we'll come back and focus on, on cosmos. Iliadi believed that myth was an account of the human experience of the sacred in its purest forms. In other words, one of the things that Iliadi believed is that the further you go in traditions, a lot of the time you, 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 get, you get much farther away from the, pure, from the descriptions of the pure experience of the eruption of the sacred. So <clears throat> what I need to do is to give you a little bit of a sense of Iliadi's description of the eruption of the sacred into human experience. Uh, that's what he tries to talk about in that book, The Sacred and the Profane. But what you've got to get a feel for is that Iliadi believed that for 
archaic tribal human beings, there was a clear distinction between ordinary experiencing and an experience of the sacred coming into their lives. That, that this encounter with the sacred was clear, that when it happened there wasn't any doubt about it, and that you have to understand this experience of the sacred and the what they call in, in academic circles the phenomenology of the sacred. You have to have a sense of that before you can get any sense of the understanding of myth. So there's a direct tie between understanding myth and the encounter with the sacred. So uh, now I want you to hold this in your mind. This afternoon we're going to be talking about the encounter, the Jungian concept of the encounter with the self with a big S. And I want remind me to talk about the transcendent function in this context, the Jung's concept of the transcendent function, because that's a psychological way of talking about the encounter with the sacred uh, that, we, that we reflect on in mythical terms. What did Iliadi believe uh, uh, was included in this experience of the encounter with the sacred? Well, First of all, it was a definite break into your ordinary, day-to-day, -day, historical life experience. In other words, you could tell the difference between an encounter with the sacred and, uh, you know, washing the dishes. You know. I mean, this is not one of those uh, points of view that, well, everything is sacred, and so, uh, since everything is sacred, uh, then all I have to do is kind of collect myself and, and walk through my day, and I've adequately dealt with the sacred. And there are a lot of traditions that have developed in, in, in uh, spiritual practice that, that totally de-emphasize any sense of the er eruption of the sacred in the human experience. But this is not what Iliadi was talking about. He's talking about the sense of, uh, here's the word, hierophany. Hierophany. Can anybody spell it? H i e r o p h a n y. Hierophany. Uh, uh, the word hierophany. Let me give you a few uh, words that Iliadi used, and we'll talk about them in this context. The first is that one. That's the most important. Hierophany. It means manifestation of the sacred. Then. An associated word is kratophany, K-R-A-T-O-P-H-A-N-Y. That means a manifestation of power. And uh, they are related but not the same. Now, we'll be thinking, remember, how do I get power to do the work I need to do, either for myself or for the world? So if you're not having any kratophanies, in your life, then uh, you've got a fuel problem, right? Uh, you've got a problem of getting resourced enough for the energy that you need to do what you need to do. Uh, Iliadi was really clear, though, that in, in human beings, he thought had a wonderful, uh, or at least typical, I don't guess you'd say wonderful, but a typical way of sort of trivializing things after they get away from the central experience. So. You can have a kratophany by just being in the presence of, of a very arrogant person. See, I mean, you can experience a certain kind of charismatic power, and that can be a kratophany for you, but it may not be a manifestation of the sacred. That's the question you'd want to ask. Is that a manifestation of the sacred or not? Uh, I, I can argue that it might be a demonic expression of the sacred, but uh, but 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 there are experiences of power uh, that may not be a manifestation of the sacred. Uh, if you've been near a very loud engine running, uh, you may have some bodily experience of power, but it may not connote the sacred for you. So Iliadi makes this distinction, a hierophany, a manifestation of the sacred. It breaks into the profane time. It reorders things. 
You're never the same after it breaks in as you were before. Now, Christians have this uh, word called epiphany. Does anybody recognize that word? Can you tell us what it means for Christians, epiphany? Yeah. For me, it means um, it's the feast that we celebrate in our church. And, yeah. and uh, it comes after Christmas, and it has always meant to me um, the, the story of Christmas was, was somewhat hidden. And uh, at epiphany, Christ is made manifest the world. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you got to get that now. We've got to get a feeling for this because if you don't get the feeling for it, uh, then you won't, you won't get through the thing connecting your corpus callosum, connecting your brain <laughs> to the sides of your brain. Uh, okay. The making manifest. Now, that is what Iliade is getting at here because, you know, you got the story, you get, you get the, the, uh, the wise men, you know, my jai, they're seeing the star, and they know something's coming up. They, they, they're aware something is about to happen in the myth. And then, in a very obscure place, with the shepherds probably the first really to see, and the donkeys, you know, I mean, uh, boom, it is... It is manifest in a very hidden, very endangered being. This being is so endangered that the being has to be taken uh, into a kind of exile for a while. Now look at that. Now you need to be thinking about that as we, as we talk about the manifestation of the center and what has to be done when the center is manifest at first until it gets stronger until it can be protected and so forth. But then later it is presented to the world. And this is related. We're coming close, I mentioned in the write-up, as we near 2,000 people are getting a little compulsively aware of all the mythology of the apocalypse. Well, what does the word apocalypse mean? Anybody take a stab at that? Apocalypse. What does that, what does that, that word connote? Yeah. Hmm? Isn't that the breaking of chaos? Well, it is that. It certainly is a part of this whole mythic uh, uh, complex that we've got here. Uh, but it really means the revealing. It is, it is you know, the, the, they call the book of Revelation. It's, it's also called the apocalypse. It's related to the manifestation theme. So there is all of this mythology in the world related to the concept of, of cosmos, which has to do with the revealing of what? Well, we'll get le uh, later on this morning, we will get into, uh, in, that, in that mythic tradition, in the Judeo-Christian mythic tradition, I want us to think about the Judeo side of that and its sweeping look at that, and then look at the Christian take on that. But uh, the New Jerusalem in the Christian myth and the New Jerusalem is going to be revealed, see? Boom. It's going to come down from heaven. Boom. And that is an image of cosmos. The New Jerusalem is an image of cosmos. And we'll talk later this morning about the way that image works in that mythic tradition. It's different in other mythic traditions, but the same motif is there. And so, uh, so uh, Iliadi is emphasizing that when you have this encounter with the sacred in human experience, you get it. You know you had it. There's not any doubt about it. If there's any doubt about it, you didn't have it. See? And what does it do? Well, here is a, a key thing in Iliadi, and we'll, we'll do this more after the break. But it establishes a center. You didn't establish the center. We might say out of your ego or any other part of your anatomy. Uh, it established the center. And if you, uh, I once did a study with Iliadi on uh, Islamic traditions, uh, 
in the pilgrimage. And uh, so every place that the sacred manifested in their tradition, one of their practices was if you would be making the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, you would come upon these places where the sacred had manifested in a given form. And what you would do, and this is not just a Muslim practice. Some of you will be able to tell us other practices about this. But what if you were a Muslim, you're walking along there, you would pick up a stone and you would put it there when you came by. And you would be acknowledging the way that that center had erupted, bam, into time and space. And you would put a stone there as your acknowledgement of that breaking in of the center. And then you would move on. And if you follow the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, there are all of these places where the center has manifested uh, and leading right on up to the great Kaaba, the black cube, uh, uh, which is the center of their circumambulation and their pilgrimage uh, at Mecca. So anyway, uh, this thing establishes a center. And at this center is the axis mundi, the center of the cosmos, of the world. It is the connecting point with, as Iliadi puts it, the beginning. It is the connecting point with the creative forces that originated all the worlds. Now, in my, uh, in my uh, workshop that I did on creation mythology, we talked a lot about that, and we can, we can reiterate some of that after our break. Uh, but, uh, but what you got to get is that in Iliadi, myth carries the story of the time of creation. It recounts the time when the connection with being, with a capital B, was clear. And the source of energy was not endangered or weak. It recounts the time when there was no question whether or not there was enough meaning, enough power, enough wisdom, enough will uh, to create a world. Myth is not just a kind of interesting little story for Iliadi. Uh, that, uh, that the elders of the tribe got together to cook up to bamboozle all the young men and women. See, it wasn't that at all. What it recounted, and the reason the elders of tribes put so much time into remembering it, was it, it, it put them in touch with the sources of life, the wellsprings, the fountainhead. And without being able to tell those stories, you couldn't get back to connect with it. And so you were cut off into history with no source of orientation, life force, or vision. See that? So why study mythology for a human being uh, of tribal times? Because if you did not study it and you did not connect with it, and you did not honor it, then you were lost in history, in what Iliadi called the terrors of history. And I think, let's, let's take our break now, but I think that's a great way to talk about where we find ourselves today, lost in the terrors of history. Yeah. As you talk in that way, I, I kind of like a renewed appreciation yeah. for the Big Bang Theory. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of interest about that yeah. now. And Seeing that theory as a myth, as yeah. a form of intellectualized yeah. myth, yeah. takes on a new meaning Absolutely. now. Because it does bring it right back to that moment. Absolutely. When there was enough power and enough energy in the universe for it to create. Concentrated energy. Uh, if you look at the Big Bang Theory, and as he says, all this uh, reflection right now, uh, and you look at these creation myths throughout the world, uh, it is astounding similarities, many of them. You know, the cosmic egg, uh, the 
golden egg. In fact, take a look at the break. Let's take a break now. But take a look at the break at this. Uh, right here is Mount Meru, and it is a not a golden egg, but it's the same thing. It's the golden mountain. It's a mountain of gold. Ascent, which is uh, we'll have to talk about the symbolism of gold as it relates to all this. Let's take our break and come back in about ten minutes or so. For about uh, maybe 25 minutes or so, 20 to 25 minutes is to uh, is to go over some more of these central themes and motifs in the mythology of cosmos. Um, and then I would like us to share some uh, narratives from different traditions about this. Uh, this vision of cosmos. And uh, we will not have time to get in very much, but what I think we'll be able to see is the richness of this uh, imaginative uh, narrative that humans have had. And what I want you to keep in your mind, and this is, see, I, I want to say that I want to argue a radical point of view here, if we can. And, uh, and uh, the, the radical point of view, I want to argue, is that uh, this, is not, this vision is not just a pipe dream of uh, a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of uh, regressed individuals. Uh, any more than the idea of cohesive selfhood is a pipe dream of regressed individuals. Uh, and so, uh, by saying that, I want, I want us to be uh, looking at these images uh, in the way that we might look at a blueprint of psyche uh, as, a, as a possibility of how we might grow. Uh, but anyway, we'll get into that a lot more uh, this afternoon and, uh, and tomorrow. But let me just focus on some of these different, uh, try to get us to get a feel for these different uh, uh, aspects to the cosmos mythology. And I have mentioned, <coughs> I have mentioned the tie to the creation, uh, to what Iliadi calls in Illud Tempus, I-L-L-U-D-T-E-M-P-U-S, which is his way of characterizing the return to the beginnings. He does not believe that any clear picture of the mythology of cosmos uh, uh, is unrelated to the sense of the beginnings. Uh, in other words, he looks at the history of elaborations of mythic forms and symbolic forms. And for example, one of the things he'd say about folk tales and fairy tales and uh, sagas and things like that. He thinks that throughout history, what you get is a gradual uh, sort of moving away from clarity about the sacred origins. But if you have an eye to see the cosmogonic, that's the word, the, the, the creation, the, the origin mythology, you, if you have an eye to see it, you will see the traces of it in a lot of folklore and a lot of fairy tales. Uh, but he really believes that the key to understanding mythology of cosmos is the, in looking back to this unbelievably full time of the beginnings. So uh, that is a key to his understanding of myth. Once you get clear that Iliadi is going to see that telling myth points you back to the, as the Aborigines would say, to the dream time. And why? Because that's when the energy was concentrated. That's when the power was fully present. Uh, that's when creativity was so focused that it could achieve uh, the origination of things as they should be. Now, I've mentioned the importance of the center, and I really want to underline the concept of the center 
and put it in italics, you know, bold relief. Because the mythology of cosmos cannot be understood without a sense of the mythology of the center with a capital C. Now, uh, we could do a whole bunch of workshops and courses just on the center and all the mythology and theory about the center and everything, but you can, this afternoon we'll think about it in relationship to psychology, the idea of a center in the psyche. And the radical way that you have to differentiate between psychologies on where they put the center. Or you could ask it this way, is there a center in this psychology or this approach to psychology? Many of them don't even have a concept of center. Uh, many of them think that the idea of a center is, uh, is somehow regressive or fundamentalistic or some, in a, some other way uh, 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 not really very positive idea. That's increasingly the trend today, to think that fantasies of the center are fascist. Amazing. But anyway, so so this idea of the center is, is key, and we'll talk about it in psychology this afternoon, but in mythology, we've got to get some, look at the way these things are, are centered. And uh, if you study comparative mythology, you see enormous variations on the theme of the center out there. One of these days, I ought to teach a workshop or a course on pilgrimage, phenomenology and psychology of pilgrimage, because that's a study of the centers out there and going to the center out there. If you've ever been on a pilgrimage, most of the people here today have been on a pilgrimage of some kind. And, uh, and a pilgrimage is very simply a journey to the center out there, not in here. It's experienced as outside the, the ego shall we say. And uh, this is the reason for pilgrimage. This is the unconscious basis for all pilgrimage phenomena. There is, a, there is the human intuition that if I am to be renewed, I must find the center. What center? The center. Which one is that? It is the center of cosmos. It is the one talked about in cosmos mythology. Why do I have to find the center in order to be renewed? Somebody, you stay with this Iliadi frame. Why would you need to find the center to be renewed? It's the eternal fount. It's the eternal fount. It's the eternal fount of what? Everything. All right order. All right empowerment. All right energy. It is, in a sense, the, the place where the Tao is expressed most clearly. It's where Mat, the law of God in Egypt, is expressed most clearly, where Torah is expressed most clearly in Jewish tradition. Uh, uh, it is the Holy of Holies. Uh, it is the temple in Jerusalem before the uh, destruction of the temple. Um, so uh, it is Kaaba in Islam, see. And you go there. Do what? It's also somehow active and yet not. It is a still point. There is a peace and quiet at the center. There is no anxiety at the center. See. If you read the T. S. Eliot stuff about the the center cannot hold. This is all, this is related to this cosmos mythology. And T.S. Eliot was a poet that picked up on the way in which modern people have a very hard time even imagining a center, see, much less finding it, see, in themselves or in other folks. So, uh, but the center doesn't exist just for itself. I mean, that's the important thing to get here. What, what is, you might put it this way. What is this mythic center for? 
It is a fountain of blessing. It is, it is for life. It is for abundant life and blessing. And the individual is, is acknowledging that, you know, this is not me. I mean, I, I don't control this thing. At best, I may be able to locate it and relate to it appropriately. But in short, it is not my ego. And so when you hear Buddhists talking about getting beyond ego, what they are really talking about is, hey, your ego is not the center. As long as you live as if your ego is the center, you're going to live in chaos, not cosmos. And uh, so you can see in these various spiritual traditions their apprehensions in their spiritual practice about this sort of thing. Uh, remind me to say something about Zen practice uh, uh, a little bit later this morning. But Okay. But the center is characterized, as I uh, mentioned earlier, by a surplus of being. Iliadi makes this clear. Why do, do tribal peoples, why are they so preoccupied with that? Because there are not very many places in the world, in their view, uh, where there's enough being. It's not that there's a whole bunch of places where there's more than enough being. Now, this would be easy for us to connect with psychologically this afternoon. I mean, what is depression? It's the experience of there not being enough being. And, uh, and so uh, the, the tribal peoples were very clear about this. Look, well, wow, you know, going through the days, uh, it's very clear that there is scarcity. And scarcity in many, many ways. But they did not have a sense of being lost from uh, a center which was the navel of the world, uh, w from through which flowed this uh, energy, uh, the nectar of the gods, the the milk of the gods, the uh, soma of the gods, the uh, and so on. And so you get that sense of uh, what the Gnostics called the pleroma fullness breaking in. That is a much understudied concept. I'm glad the Jung Institute's going to be doing a, a uh, conference on Gnosticism uh, next year sometime. Uh, uh, Murray Stein's been doing some work with that sort of thing and sponsoring some conferences that will be looking at these uh, Gnostic traditions. But, but among the Gnostic concepts, uh, is this sense of the pleroma, the fullness of being that is behind the world of appearance. And it's directly related to this mythology of cosmos. Now, if it were simple, if we could stop it right there, then uh, human history would look different. But Iliadi is constantly characterizing this struggle of, of cosmos and history. He's got a book called Cosmos and History, which is an important book to look at. Uh, but he believes that it's been the historical experience of human beings that, uh, that forever in our experience of life and time, there is a fall away from the center, a tendency to lose touch with it and therefore a necessity to have divination techniques. All of these divination techniques that people have used throughout history to try to find connection with the, with the center and the source. Uh, but it's not, in most of the mythology of cosmos, it's not merely just a sort of a running down of an engine or running out of energy that's going on. This is where we get to the issue of, of evil in cosmos. Because in most human traditions with regard to uh, world, right order, there is a sense of 
evil is an active force. That there is a sense of, of agency operating to uh, bring in chaos rather than cosmos and to, and to resist the formation of, uh, of uh, right order. And the reference that I like to give people on that is the, uh, the book by Forsyth, F-O-R-S-Y-T-H, called The Old Enemy, which is a comparison of mythologies of the struggle of chaos and cosmos. Uh, let me just say just a, a word about the current discussions of chaos. There are a lot of discussions of chaos today that uh, uh, in relationship to chaos theory and the uh, physical sciences and so forth. Uh, uh, what you should not assume from that is that in most of human mythology that chaos is positive. It is not. It is not another word for liminality or or, or the destructuring process uh, preceding uh, 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 healthy change. Uh, there is a sense of, uh, of uh, destructive agency in mythic traditions with regard to cosmos. It's not something you want to get friendly and rub up against. Uh, in fact, if you're like me, You've got plenty of chaos in your life. You don't need to try to be looking to befriend it because it's, it, it's coming on. Uh, uh, I had some painters come into my house uh, uh, this past week, and, and, and uh, very shortly thereafter, I fell and hurt my ankle, right? I mean, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when your cosmos is disturbed by uh, any kind of forces, we'll talk about that a little bit this afternoon. It's very interesting to watch how one little piece of disorder leads to another in your everyday life. We can have a little confession time this afternoon. <laughs> I'm serious about that because I think we ought to share with each other things that you have noticed about the cosmosation in your life, how you try to, how you try to evoke this sense of cosmos through ritual or uh, spiritual practice and what you have noticed about chaos breaking in to your life synchronistically. You may want to be thinking about that some because if you, if you reflect on this, you will notice patterns. Uh, archaic people studied this carefully. They paid close attention to this. They didn't blow, blow it off as a topic. They were very aware that chaos breeds chaos. And so when chaos manifested in one sector of their lives, they didn't just kind of shrug and go on. They paid attention to that, and they did things ritually to balance it. So we'll come back to that today. So this cosmos and evil thing, uh, evil is seen as an active opponent. There's even a king archdemon of evil and a queen archdemon of evil that is making war on cosmos. And we will need to think this afternoon about, uh, about the psychology of that. I have come to some conclusions about the way that operates in the psyche. And I have come to some conclusions about the sort of the plumbing of this uh, in our individual psyches and the way that we can think about uh, uh, the powerful agency of uh, chaos in our lives. We'll talk about that in relationship to grandiosity and some other things. So in other words, if you think about these things, the return to the beginnings for renewal, the, the, the necessity of locating the center, you didn't create it, you can't create the center, you have to find the center. Uh, because if you think you're creating the center, you're a modern human being. See, modern human beings really kind of believe that they create the center. That's the... Uh, what results is a lot of this trashy modern architecture we've got. It has no sense of context, no sense of the human, no sense of space that's adequate for human in, or any other kind of inhabit <laughs> inhabitation. 
but uh, but modern culture is 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 tone deaf with regard. I'm talking about culturally modern expressions, or is tone deaf with re with regard to the center issue. Uh, and in the mythology of cosmos, there is clarity about the fragility of cosmos. That it is established from a center, and it it proceeds outward from the center. That's another thing I forgot to mention. We really need to think about that a lot today and tomorrow. Cosmos doesn't start from the edges. Let's, we need to think about that a lot, practically speaking, in terms of practical implications for our personal lives and for the society and the world. It doesn't start at the edge. It starts at the center and comes outward. Now, there's always an edge depending on how far you've been able to push the edge of cosmos in your life, how much you can include without fragmenting, right? So there's always the issue of the edge. I mean, we need to, don't let me forget for us to talk this afternoon about the issue of, of dealing with the edge here. But the insight they've got that we've got to remember is it that right order never starts from the edge. It always starts from the center. And so this afternoon we're going to be thinking, and I want you to really share with each other and with me, okay, so how do you find the center actually in practice? And how do you work from the center out? Because that is the way they have told the story, center out. And so what I'm suggesting to you is they knew something about your management of anxiety and your management of your own power, etc. So we'll be coming back through this uh, uh, as we go. Uh, but now I'd like to turn in the rest of our time, I'd like for us to share and discuss uh, some narratives together about the images of The uh, old theologians used to call this Heilgeschichte, Heilgeschichte, salvation history, or the mythology of redemption, uh, uh, because that's what we want to talk about. Let's, let's, let's think about some of these visions of, of the redemption process, that is the movement from chaos and death to centeredness right order, fullness of being, regeneration, renewal, initiation. You talk about initiation. This is the context of initiation. Why is it the context of initiation? No one is initiated according to tribal peoples until they know about this. It's not enough to get your driver's license or your Uzi. It's not enough to have your most successful drive-by shooting to be a man or a woman. You know, you got to know about this. You have to know how to find and connect with the center. So, uh, so the initiation process is directly related to cosmos mythology. There is no meaning. This is what drives me nuts about some of these people running around mouthing off about initiation because they have no sense about it being involved with a second birth into connection with the fullness of being. And that is what it always meant in tribal cultures across the planet. See, yes? It's difficult in modern times, I think, for people to maintain a sense of their traditional uh, origin myths. Yes. And there's an anthropologist I know whose preference was to work in New Guinea or perhaps Borneo because in contrast to all the other tribal peoples, he says they still somewhat believe in New Guinea that they're the center of the, the world. And more recently than he had said that to me, another New Guineans that I know went to attend the last initiation um, rite in, in his group, which was the Chimbari tribe. That is, they're no longer going to be gathering these tribal boys anymore to initiate them into this mountain highland manhood. 
and now they're going to the to the towns to more Port Moresby and stuff. So here too is another country that because of the dominance of Western culture and radio enough it is en is enough to kind of like disrupt their whole sense of like everything happening in their village. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the name of the book that he published on that? Is there a book on this on this tradition that he's published? The the anthropologist you're talking about. Well, the initiation rites that this guy wrote about is um, described in Guardians of the Flute. Guardians of the Flute by Gil Hurt, but it was another anthropologist who mm -hmm. told me about his preference for working. Right, all over the world. See, this is happening. The tribal people are losing their touch with these origin myths and uh, and their ritual practices around them. And that's one of the things we'll have to talk about uh, probably tomorrow a lot about, well, well, what is our time like with regard to this? Does this mean we're no longer going to have uh, the connection with the center? That's what a lot of people think. A lot of the intellectuals think, well, the whole idea of a center was an outmoded concept. Uh, I was uh, uh, traveling in, the, uh, in Borneo sea dyaks and the same thing was happening there and uh, you, any, you go out to indigenous peoples around the world you'll see the incredible devastation that has been brought about in their tribal uh, experience through the encounter with radio and TV and cigarettes I mean the sea dyaks had, had been given cigarettes by our Westerners and that was our contribution to their culture Lodge, yes, that's right. You know, and what we're seeing now increasingly around the world, and here again we're anticipating tomorrow, is, uh, is incredible social anomie and the rise of uh, uh, gang warfare throughout the world. Uh, not, uh, interestingly enough, it's not just a phenomenon in American cities. That throughout the world now, there is a, a, a incredible burgeoning of gang warfare particularly among young males, but not just among them, as these tribal traditions uh, disappear. So we'll have to address that. But let's get to your traditions now, because even if you're not participating in a ritual way in these traditions, there are images from these traditions that you've participated in or that you've studied that, you, that relate to this image of cosmos. And uh, so let's, let's hear uh, the images that you've studied the most, what are they, what tradition are they from, and give us a vision, give us the uh, basic symbols of, of the vision of that, of that tradition. Yes? Uh, I can speak very simply from the Greek Orthodox background. Uh, when I was a child and walked into the church, even though I didn't know any of the, the words or the sounds of the language, it was immediately apparent to me, just through seeing the symbols in front of me, the icon, the symbol of the cross is depicted in our Greek Orthodoxy as an equal cross. It's not just, uh, you know, the cross of Christ. Uh, looking at the eagle, looking at the mother image, which is uh, a big image of Christ, uh, more specifically as I grew up and later would understand the, the liturgy, which is uh, the term used for the Mass, when the Bible, or the, the Bible which is plated with gold, comes out of the... Uh, they call it the iconostasis, which is where they have the icons. Heaven is represented back behind, yeah. and where the people are is the world. So the beauty of that is that <laughs> when you watch, when they first start the, the service, and you watch the Bible coming out from heaven and coming into the world, we all do our cross yeah. three times. It represents that the light and the truth were coming to the people. Yes. So then... Uh, in the Orthodox faith, there's not a lot. Uh, it's a five sensory, maybe even a six sensory phenomenon because we don't just read out of books. In fact, uh, we see that reading books is really taking away from the <laughs> bigness of the experience. Get that from the bigness of the experience. Now, see, that's really key. This is, this is Go ahead. Right. Allow me to say oh, it this way. Really, the thing about the senses, there's something to smell, the incense. There's something to taste, which is the communion. There's something to hear, the music. 
there is something if you if you want to look at you look at the icons but as a child being brought into it you can enter that experience immediately and don't even need to participate just by being in, in that atmosphere you you look around at people and you can get that now one of the things that it was striking to me when I grew up was watching the marriage ceremony mm -hmm. because in the it's marriage it's, it's amazing what I see too is that there's a lot of circles uh, and it's funny because just say something about the marriage ceremony in this context yeah. because most those if they haven't been to one of the marriage ceremonies they need to Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. This, is, this is great the marriage ceremony has circles in it and the circles first of all there's a table placed in the middle of the altar in fact, the baptism is done in a cir circular vessel too, but I'll move to the marriage ceremony because it speaks about cosmos specifically. Yes. Uh, there is a table that is placed in the middle of this uh, area where the people are, not where the iconostasis is or where you, where you are behind uh, the heaven part. And on that table are placed two wreaths which the uh, husband and wife will wear. They are in the shape of the circle and there's a cup there and candle and what is done is as we chant uh, and go around the table the husband and wife at each at each station there are prayers recited and that this is what's interesting represents the walking around with Christ with the love of God in in the universe the, the table represents the universe and you represent yourself as moving around and experiencing that with a partner being with Christ and when the two uh, wreaths are placed and the father represents uh, you know he says all of the prayers the wreaths are exchanged so and they're both bound by a ribbon so there is again another meaning and connection with exchanging almost the energy or the field of, of experience of each of the people around this central item around the central table male and female yes male and female or exchange and it keeps and it keeps well we'll talk about that this afternoon uh, so i mention this only because and it's so rich uh, i used to look at the books the book list you could stop at any one symbol and you can read a whole history of right. why that symbol came into being and was used uh, the, one of the things that impressed me the most was the couple it metaphorically would be walking around this table as they would be walking around in life together right. making their journey through the universe yeah. so and they bring see the idea is that they bring cosmos with them they are participating in the center but but the center actually spreads through their circumambulation through the world there's a sense in which they carry it with them very true. The sadness now that I'm going to tell you, and then I'll be done, is that most uh, people who have participate in this, and this is sad for me and seeing it in the Orthodox Church, as I want to be a priest first, I ended up being a chiropractor, because that was the way I could bring my love to the people, was um, that most people don't know the significance yes, of that, right. and the priests cannot take time to explain it, because a lot of people are so caught up in the I will call them the trivialities of the worldliness of the of the marriage history, so. the history of it. See, yes. they're caught up in history. Yeah, sure. The priest, uh, but then again, representing it as uh, the logos of speaking forth through him, yeah. but not him. Yeah. One last thing to say is, in the Orthodox Church, as different from the Roman Catholic Church, we uh, or they do not look at a center being in any person. It had to be something other. There is no pope. There is the archbishops are all equally powered and each one is just another version of the story. So this is interesting also that the resurrection is placed emphasis on versus the crucifixion. The pain of Christ was important, but it was the resurrection that brought forth. Which is that which is the emphasis on the fullness of being then, see. Now today we ought to get a sense for for the 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 Roman Catholic side of that because if you read that Roman Catholic mythology you can see how it fits the cosmos myth too, but uh, but in this tradition there is the emphasis on the fullness, the regeneration, the the return to fullness there. Now the other thing is 
if you go to one of these Orthodox churches, one of the things you'll notice is that uh, people out in the congregation uh, may chat. <laughs> and you think about this in the context of the cosmos stuff. Heaven is cosmos. You got to get this is nirvana. This is cosmos. This is here. It is there. It's not threatened by anybody talking. You, I mean, you you got to get it. It's not in danger. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, you got to get the mythic sense of that. See, that is to say, if you really have a sense of the center, your anxiety level goes down uh, with regard to these manifestations of bad manners. Not that you don't notice or, or don't, uh, you know, have feelings and so forth about them, but in, is, if you're aware of cosmos, uh, one of the big effects it has on you is it drops your anxiety level like a rock. And one of the litmus tests psychologically is the more aware you are of cosmos, your anxiety level goes down. It does not peak out. Well, we'll get into that a lot this afternoon. But it's, but it's like you can just take this to the bank in terms of the psyche. Without a sense of centeredness, your anxiety level will peak, and you can just take this with an empirical test. Take one of these Milan uh, personality inventories. If you're peaking out on anxiety measures, then there's not been enough work with trying to do stuff with re re in relationship to the center because... The, as we'll see this afternoon, in my view, the center, the psyche is, is, is organized in such a way that there are a lot of s aspects of the psyche which do not bring you to the center. That's not their job. Uh, uh, that, they, they, they are parts of the whole cooperating together, so we'll get into that a lot this afternoon. But I appreciate your sharing that. Let's, uh, uh, let's let's hear some others now from other traditions. Uh, images, remember, like you did, stay with images of cosmos, and any particular ritual practice that that you uh, that you can mention around it. Anybody else from any tradition, not just your own, maybe. Uh, in the dervish tradition, um, the whirling of the dervish is the embodiment or, or um, bringing down the universe or the cosmos yes. within yourself. And the way the hands are is, you know, the touching of the center, bringing down the cosmos and then bringing it to the center of the earth. And it's, um, it's a very powerful thing to, to experience yourself and also watch um, a very adept dervish really get into that because then you, you're caught up into the constellation I hope that the, the, the tape picked that up. I hope it did because uh, because one of the wonderful things that you're bringing up there is the relationship between dance and cosmos, see, and the axis mundi. You're talking about the the connection. There is the center right there, and notice it is danced. The center is danced. It's not some static thing in the sense that we would mean by a negative sense of being static. And you can see the, the uh, relationship between that dance and the circumambulation of the center by the couple that he was talking about. You can also see it, if you've seen these images of Shiva dancing, the uh, Nataranya image, uh, that is the same dance. And if you see the, for example, in Jewish tradition, David dancing before the ark as it comes into Jerusalem, there is a dancing of the movement to the center. So the dance, the image of dance, and I love to talk about this whole thing, that the way to cosmos is dancing the four quarters. And so the dance image that you're bringing up is very key, and it's not, accident, and it's not an accidental image. It's no accident that sacred dance was so central in rituals of cosmos throughout the whole world. In fact, I would bet you it would be hard to find an ancient, a really ancient ritual of cosmos that did not involve dance. And that's because you can't just stop. If you stop, something's going to get out of balance. 
the dance is very clearly depicted in the four squares. There are eight figures dancing in this mandala. Also, Tai Chi tries to circumscribe the yes. cosmos with its motions. Uh, this the, the reference to Tai Chi is a good one because because in Tai Chi, uh, if you look at Tai Chi without putting it in the context of the the ancient cosmologies which used to frame it, then you're missing the point. Because all of these martial arts that are, that are old martial arts are tied back to visions of cosmos. In fact, the way I would argue it is this. Any legitimate martial art is always placed in the service of cosmos. That's what it always was in tribal traditions. There were no tribal warriors who were not in the service of cosmos. Uh, they would not have recognized anybody as a warrior if they were not pledging their loyalty to their tribal vision of cosmos. Now, later on today and tomorrow, we need to really make clear, we need to talk more about this tribal issue because one of the things I like to say to people is that no tribe ever started out to be tribal. People forget that today. You know, today, all of our tribes are starting out, they want to be tribal, right? Think about it. Uh, they think it's, it's the end thing to be tribal today. We want to be tribal. Uh, don't you use my myth, that's my myth. You know, what do you th who do you think you are using my myth, the myth of my tribe? That is a complete bastardization of the whole meaning of mythology and tribal traditions. It is really a tragic when you get some tribal peoples arguing that line. It shows they've not studied their own meaning of their own tradition because no tribal people ever started out to be tribal. They all started toward cosmos. They meant to describe the true center and to show how the, pe the people, you know, the people come to the true center. And the people includes all of the beings. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to the 2020 donors who gave at the supporting member level and above. Barbara Anand, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie K. Bryan, Eric Cooper, Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, George J. Didier, James Fidelibus, John Korolewski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Cobb, Gerald Weiner, Karen West, and James Taylor, and Ellen Young. Thank you to everybody else who gave at that level but wishes to remain anonymous. 